Alex Burns. He was very influenced by Alex Burns. He was very influenced by, uh, you know, uh, the sort of former exploits of the people that came before him, even um, Monty Elphinstone, uh, who himself went to Afghanistan and Persia before Alexander Burns. So if you want to know more about what came before this period, there is almost like, like a sort of prequel story in my Afghanistan talk. And of course, uh, a lot of what happened then ties into what will happen now. And a lot of what will happen now will tie into probably like, you know, people who came after, after Burton who are also known as the great explorers of the sort of British empire. Uh, and finally coming all the way down, you can almost trace like a direct lineage. Uh, you come to the sort of modern era with T.E. Lawrence and Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, the, the nickname of Lawrence of Arabia came from Richard Burton because Burton was known as Burton of Arabia and the Arabian Knight because he was knighted, uh, you know, much before Thomas Edward Lawrence even set foot in Arabia. So there is this like sort of lineage of like explorers, adventurers who sort of grew fascinated with the East uh, for different reasons, but you know, they sort of gave their entire lives to knowing and assimilating sort of within the culture of the East. Um, some of them are sort of labeled as Orientalists. Uh, in most cases, this is a deserved moniker. However, with Richard Burton, there are great contradictions because this man uh, loved to make a myth around himself. Uh, even going back to his father and their family, the sort of tradition of like, you don't know the actual truths of what happened and family history gets retold over and over again. Um, it, it sort of is very difficult to sort of then piece out the truth from, I wouldn't say lies, but the truth from the taller truth that sort of got pushed around. So, you know, you had many instances of like people saying that uh, Burton uh, uh, killed and shot many men and all that. And in fact, he had not even done so, uh, you know, while he was in India, basically. Um, he was like, he was not actually a soldier, even though he longed for sort of battle glory. He was a linguist at heart. He was a scholar at heart. However, these two sides of his personality, the, the sort of uh, uh, mischief maker, never do well, kind of like the black sheep uh, struggled with, you know, straight academia. So he never ever like in his life sort of followed the path of like, say somebody like you know, Macaulay, for example, or other, you know, William Jones, other sort of linguists who sort of focused with great academic sincerity on what they wanted to do. With Burton, it was always off on one adventure and then off on the other. So um, this is sort of the background to this talk. Um, because of the, um, the sort of technical issues here. I may not be able to show you everything, but I will definitely talk about it. And I will leave links in the group if you are at all curious. So you can definitely message or ask me later and I will let you know everything about that. So let's sort of start with this and I'll maybe like, maybe switch this uh, video off so that it doesn't lag. All right, so this is this is a quote that I sort of uh, put in here from Richard Burton. Travelers like poets are mostly an angry race. And you know, this sort of contradicts what we now sort of call, you know, wanderlust and travel influencer and all of these things because, you know, travel is seen as a sort of uh, great, uh, uh, a uh, great sort of relaxing activity. You know, people love to travel, they enjoy traveling and all of that. But in his age, you didn't go travel just for the heck of it. You had to have like a serious sort of um, passion for traveling. 
uh, they basically they had you know to come to india from england required at least 4 to 6 months and you could be shipwrecked and any number of things could happen to you so you didn't just travel because you felt like it on a whim uh, you traveled because there was something like seriously urging you into travel and often times you didn't just leave home and go out into the world where there could be any number of like dangers to your life just like that so you had to have something sort of driving you forward and in fact richard burton mentions this um, in one of his notes and it is the title of one of his later sort of uh, biographies that uh, the devil drives me you know uh, which is a very crucial thing because like for him always there was a sort of unexplained reason of trying to figure things out that pushed him to go to different places otherwise why would you do this you know sort of exercises so this is this is sort of from his personal uh, notes when he went into i think uh, harare i think this is from his journey into either zanzibar or harare but i think it's a very telling quote because um we are not sort of we are not privy to him but we can because we are not privy to his personal sort of ideas because of this like great miasma of myth making around him but we are privy in a certain way to his points of view when it comes to sort of small little statements like this so i think this is a very telling statement anyway okay why is this going all right so this is sort of like the place that richard burton was born it's called tokay it's in devon um it's a very short distance in fact from uh the birth places and sort of homes of walter raleigh and all the great francis drake all the great elizabethan adventurers that came before him in fact and people say that it might have obviously also influenced sort of his life because if you're born in such an area and you grow up sort of he didn't grow up entirely in tokay but if you tokay i think i'm not certain about the pronunciation but uh it sort of influences you when you realize that your birthplace also was the birthplace of these sort of great adventurers that went out in the world and did great things so he um was a man of many sort of talents and nothing really sort of captured his interest for too long but you can see the number of sort of hats that he wore um geographer translator writer soldier orientalist cartographer ethnologist i would say even anthropologist because what he did was basically uh amateur anthropology now a uh, poet fencer diplomat the fencing part of course was something that he carried on even well into his old age um you know there's a very famous portrait of him later in life um that sort of shows him in fencing gear but he actually took up fencing at an extremely young age and his father being a soldier sort of allowed various schools of fencing to train him so he, he was trained in the french method he was trained in the italian method and sort of became master of both forms of fencing and then later on he went to write uh, the book of the sword which is of course a, a book all about sort of the history of different kinds of swords and fencing and techniques and how you should perform certain maneuvers and exercises and it's a fascinating book because it's a subject that's very close to his heart so these are sort of his interest areas and uh, you know this is kind of you know we are swiftly approaching the time when he would have been born at this rate all right this is the place that he was born sorry not born but like this is the place that he grew up in this is actually his maternal grandfather's house ba barham house all right um basically this place was his mother's father's uh 
house. It this is a later photograph. This was sort of uh, updated and expanded, and you know changes were made to it. But uh, this is sort of basically the kind of place and estate that he grew up in. His mother's father was very wealthy. Um, they were uh, sort of merchants, and they you know his mother's brother, his uncle was such a wastrel and spendthrift that you know he he would he he was almost disinherited from the family sort of property and uh, not that you know his grandfather had maternal grandfather had great love for richard's father as well but you know the fact is that you know between his own son and you know his wife's husband he much preferred that the property should go to uh, you know his daughter's husband and their children. So in fact, there's an apocryphal story. We don't know if it's true, uh, because as I said, when you deal with the Burtons and the Burtons collective myth-making, um, what is shared in Georgiana Sisted's uh, biography of him, uh, which is basically, you know, his sister's, uh, his niece, basically, his sister's uh, kids. Um, she says that basically um, their matern his maternal grandfather was almost going to the solicitor to change the will in favor of Richard Burton. And he sort of had a heart attack along the way and died. And so the will was never changed. And then the house went to the wastrel son. And this house was worth sort of 80,000 pounds back in the day. It was a huge sum of money. Uh, it would have really sort of changed uh, Richard's entire course of life. But, uh, you know, this was the sort of initial uh, setback that the family sort of faced. And uh, what ended up happening is that the house went to the wastrel son. And then, of course, uh, Richard's father and the family started moving back and forth between England and various European um, places. Uh, this had a huge impact on Richard's life because what ended up happening is that if you don't grow up in England and you don't go to uh, you know certain public schools and you don't have a certain circle of people, you end up becoming alienated because everybody knew everybody. And you know when you went into higher education, you somehow did not have any background or any sort of um, reliable, circle to fall back on. So then you ended up, as Richard did, becoming some sort of black sheep. And, you know, the headmasters did not, quote unquote, know your family. So, you know, they were apt to think of you as like some sort of ne'er-do-well troublemaker, which is exactly what happened in Richard's life. Both him and his brother did not finish when they went to Oxford. They were rusticated. Uh, he was rusticated, I think, Edward, his brother, uh, left without getting a degree but Richard's father was a soldier and uh, you know he had fought in the Napoleonic campaigns he had fought in Italy he had fought in France and had eventually ascended to a certain like level which was to become the mayor of Genoa and so again this is apocryphal family history um uh, nobody is a reliable narrator in the story of Richard Burton's life, but these are the tales that got passed down through the family. It is said that Richard Burton's father, while he was in Genoa, happened to be witness to the um, fight between, you know, uh, Queen Charlotte and Prince George, uh, that would be George IV, um, and basically took a series of wrong and rash decisions which sort of affected family fortunes forever to come. And I shall come to that later, but basically this is the sort of early background of their life is that they shifted around from place to place and Richard and Edward and even their sister Maria sort of grew up very wild um, and most importantly grew up extremely multilingual. Uh, they knew Greek because they would go hang out at the ports and like speak like Greek merchants, not sort of classical educated Greek. Um, they knew French, uh, they knew Italian, all of this was extremely sort of um, 
uh, upsetting to them when they went back to England and found themselves sort of surrounded by a very um, uh, non-cosmopolitan crowd or milieu. So basically, it was it was almost like a uh, you know who's uh, whose video is on? Can you please switch it off? Thank you. Please check your video. Um, so basically, they grew up in this extremely cosmopolitan atmosphere, and this is one of their other houses um, outside tours uh, in France, where they had also moved around uh, intermittently. This is, of course, a later photograph. Uh, photography obviously wasn't invented uh, in the 1820s, back when they were moving around France and Italy. So basically, this is the early years of Richard Burton's life. Um, their father tried to give them a good education. Um, they, they basically uh, had fencing masters and drawing teachers and music teachers. In fact, uh, again, another apocryphal story is that uh, Richard was given violin lessons and he hated it. And because he hated it so much, he refused to learn. Although he was an extremely gifted student in any other matter, he just refused to learn the violin and ultimately ended up banging the violin on the instructor's head, uh, which is a famous example of his like sort of early bad temper when it came to these sorts of things. He was an extremely tempestuous man. Um, the, the, the story goes that uh, the Burton side of the family, his father's side of the family. Um, the, there were sort of ancestors of Richard Burton that had, you know, uh, this idea that they were actually descended from the Bourbon kings of France and, uh, you know, via a, a bastard line, basically. And that, uh, you know, the family still sort of had claims to both you know, French royalty and French nobility, but also uh, the fact that uh, Richard Burton uh, looked the way he looked, which is uh, sallow skin, large dark eyes, black hair, uh, made him the subject of intense teasing by all of his sort of early school classmates because they would call him a gypsy. Um, and it is a fact that, you know, um, in Ireland, Burton is a common gypsy surname. Uh, and that, you know, uh, the way he looked would have sort of people would have drawn the correlation between the two. And in fact, his wife, Isabel Burton, uh, I shall come to her later, but uh, his wife, Isabel Burton, uh, her, her sort of maiden name was Isabel Arundel. And she was she herself was related to the you know barons of Aranda. Um, they they had an idea, uh, you know, she had met some gypsy when she was young, and the gypsy had told her that, you know, your husband will be one of us. And of course, when she first saw Richard, she immediately was like, Oh, he looks like a gypsy. And she claims that that was when she knew that Richard would be become her husband. Uh, but again, nothing is a reliable fact. Both Richard, his family, his wife were prone to making stories much in the same way that they translated the Arabian Nights from like whatever manuscripts that they got their hands on. Uh, they were quite apt to um, sort of disseminate information that was either not entirely true or was like a kind of fictionalized tall tale. And people were also uh, likely to swallow it at the time because it was a very romantic notion um, in that era to have a certain amount of wildness to you. Um, keep in mind that this was the era when B Lord Byron gained so much prominence by doing extremely reckless and sort of wild things uh, uh, and it kind of inflamed the romantic imagination. And I don't mean romantic as in love lawn, although Lord Byron was the subject of plenty of uh, crushes and love letters and things like that. But romantic as in the sense of, you know, uh, appealing to this sort of romanticized view of life, all right? So this is 
the era that Burton was a child and the romantic imagination had a great impact on him. The idea that your life should be spent in pursuit of you know, something great and romanticized. There's also the idea that, uh, you know, his father had been in Italy and his, you know, uh, Italy and Egypt and, you know, his wife's side, the wife's side of the family also were knighted. Uh, I mean, she descended from, uh, uh, you know, the Arundels and they famously were knighted because of, you know, their actions in the Crusades in Turkey. So, with, between both Burton and his wife, there was this sort of understanding that they were almost fated to spend their lives in the Orient. Um, that that whatever lay for them, glory and achievement was in the East um, and not in Europe or in England. So almost certainly throughout his life, um, Burton disdained England. He hated it with a, like he hated he hated what the country stood for, like the sort of uh, prudishness and morality, unnecessary morality rather. And, uh, you know, he forever and ever was sort of extremely uh, uh, disparaging of the English, the English man, the English land. Uh, there's, a, there's a very famous example from later on in his life that, you know, he, uh, happened to come back to England for something or the other and he had to report to India House and uh, you know after the sort of meeting with the board of directors at India House somebody remarked to him that you know uh, you must be glad to be back in England or something of that sort and Richard Burton gets up and pulls aside the curtain and outside the window is like thick fog you can't see anything the fog is almost milky white, thick as pea soup, as they say. And he points at this and he's like, glad to be back in this, you know. So <laughs> for Richard Burton, this is like England was a place of like almost abhorrence. You came there, did your work and then left as soon as possible. So um, each time that he came back to India, uh, so India he felt better, happier. Uh, and you know, not just India, but like elsewhere throughout the East. And uh, he, uh, like, for all his like pretensions towards like English gentility, he was the happiest when he was sort of unknown and you know grubbing around in the East, as it were. So anyway, uh, we'll sort of move on to the next slide. This is the infamous uh, Queen Charlotte. Prince George, or rather King George the uh, Fourth, Princess Charlotte, uh, Princess Charlotte, Charlotte of Brunswick, basically, um, affair that took place uh, that was an extremely uh, a harrowing thing, and it affected the Burton family fortunes quite a bit. Um, Burton's father was said to be the mayor of Genoa at the time that uh, Charlotte of Brunswick was exiled in Genoa. The reason being that, you know, Prince George, who would later become George IV, uh, disliked his wife so much and was so prone to uh, sort of, uh, was so prone to uh, kind of making like very public affairs, uh, I would say. But he also was just like a general, like bon vivant, he lived large, um, the Georgian era was an era of like very lax morals. Um, people regularly had affairs, even if they were married. Victorian morality wasn't uh, really a thing back then. So it was considered all right to have affairs as long as you know you were married and got done with the business of sort of making making your future offspring. And once you were done with that, uh, you could go about and do what you wanted, which is exactly what happened in the marriage of uh, Prince George and uh, Charlotte, uh, sorry, uh, this one of Brunswick. And basically what, Caroline of Brunswick, and what happened was that uh, uh, Caroline basically gave birth to the future heir, and just left because she could not stand 
Prince George. Uh, and she left and she sort of moved around the Mediterranean quite a bit, uh, including Italy, Milan, uh, you know, all over the place. And, uh, you know, this was considered fine until Prince George's predecessor, who was at that time King George III or Mad King George, as people call him now, uh, he died. And this fellow then became Prince George IV. And so there was this natural sort of thing of like, please locate my wife. I don't know what she's doing and where. And it turned out that she was busy having affairs with uh, an Italian gentleman. And uh, he wanted to divorce her, but you could not just divorce at the time. You had to prove adultery. And there was this great big trial. So at that trial, Richard Burton's father apparently was called upon to testify that he had seen her uh, uh, you know, having an adulterous affair. And at that time, due to his own personal sort of honor or morals, he refused to do that. And that sort of affected his career that affected, you know, he was given half pay, uh, even despite like returning to the army, he was not given the due rank that he was due. Such is the story that is put about by the Burtons, all right? Again, with the caveat that nothing is sort of fixed, um, there might be multiple reasons. Some people say that the reason why the senior Burton was given half pay and also moved around frequently was because he had, he had a habit of picking quarrels with every single senior officer and even his fellow officers. And that is certainly a trait that we see in Richard Burton himself later on. He picked numerous sort of um, uh, one-sided grudges against all of uh, the people that he met. And uh, this includes several people in Bombay. Uh, this includes his fellow explorer when he went off to search for the source of the Nile. Um, and, you know, he was, he was an, uh, an extremely short-tempered man, but he was not given to unfair or unreasonable grudges. All of the grudges that he had had some basis in the fact that people were not giving him due credit or people were sort of cutting him out of uh, various sort of things. So he was very sensitive to the fact uh, that, you know, he, he wanted some recognition or he wanted some sort of, uh, uh, you know, medals or money or grants and things like that. And there were forever and ever people sort of cutting in in front of him trying to get that, uh, even though they had used his expertise to do so. So throughout uh, his life, you will find letters going back and forth between adventurers and explorers who were like, yeah, Burton's extremely intelligent, but do not start a correspondence with him because he's like to, likely to get uh, upset or offended at you. Uh, this is the basis of an extremely famous letter to Darwin. Uh, Charles Darwin was also a member of the Royal Society and uh, he was sort of uh, corresponding with another fellow at that time. Um, and basically uh, that fellow wrote to him of Burton's grudges against uh, his partner speak in uh, the, the Nile expedition. And, uh, you know, Charles Darwin wrote back that he too had heard of, you know, Richard's sort of temperament. And he advised his uh, correspondent to steer clear of Burton, like, you know, remain on like a nodding acquaintance with him. So this sort of um, feeling of being denied or being singled out for some sort of, you know, um, uh, some sort of grudge followed him throughout his life. Uh, there, was no, there was no point in his life which did not result in some sort of kind of uh, tussle with authoritarian figures. This was very much, even into old age, a sort of thing that uh, he was very aware of that, you know, certain people had it out for him, basically. So, Portraits of the Burton children. Now, this is the supposed, uh, we don't know if this is actually them because it's uh, an unidentified artist. Um, the painting itself is currently in a private collection. 
Uh, so we haven't a really good picture of it. This is an old picture which was published in an older newspaper. Um, but this was painted when I believe he would have been around, you know, six or seven. And, you know, his brother would have been around three-ish. And uh, this was probably during that time in France because of the way that they are dressed. Um, all, all three children at the time sort of grew up together, relied on each other. There was this very famous sort of like bond between all three siblings kind of growing up wild. Um, you know, Richard was forever getting into fights and then Edward was sort of following his lead into uh, these things. And even his sister wasn't exactly like sort of an angelic, you know, <laughs> an angelic cherub. Uh, the sad thing about his younger brother is Edward, is that um, Edward also followed, as I said, Edward followed his elder brother in everything. Um, he also followed him into the Indian army. And unlike Richard, Edward actually saw a great deal of action. He was, uh, he saw action in Ceylon. He saw action at the Indian mutiny. Uh, he was very much uh, sort of, I think he was awarded a, the mutiny medal as well. Um, and the effect on that of that upon Edward was that uh, we would now call it PTSD, but at that time, Edward basically uh, was considered a lunatic and was therefore confined to a lunatic asylum. Um, and, you know, that sort of is the uh, sad, uh, sad story of his brother. His sister, uh, you know, uh, his sister married well. She married uh, uh, another fellow soldier. Uh, he actually led the relief of Lucknow. Uh, that's uh, Henry Sistead. Stisted, sorry. And Stisted, uh, you know, had a, a very good military career. So he eventually got promoted up uh, and became sort of governor of Ontario, Canada, I think. And so, you know, he was always in touch with his sister and his sister's nieces, uh, sorry, his sister's uh, kids, his nieces. She had two, um, she had two uh, girls. And uh, one of them would end up writing uh, a, a sort of contradictory biography, which would sort of, I, I will talk about this later, but basically even after his death, his wife tried to cast him in a different mold by writing multiple sort of uh, histories and biographies of their time together. And then, you know, his nieces would try to set the record straight and then write their own sort of little uh, historical, um, you know, book, and even like he was, he was a celebrated man. But after his death, there were multiple sort of uh, things of this sort where people sort of tried to rewrite or uh, change uh, what was known about him, and you know, consequently, this also sort of ties into the way his life was lived. Uh, you know, always never actually knowing what was the truth. Uh, always giving you sort of different points of view about what actually went on. So Richard Burton's life is very, very interesting to the dedicated researcher because of this reason, to try and tease out the truth. No one book you read is going to give you a, a holistic picture because all of them are pulling from sources that are themselves not reliable. So it's sort of a, a great chance to look at uh, the entirety of like a case almost and figure out from that what was the truth, basically, possibly. Uh, when it comes to his, for example, and I told you they moved around a lot. I've given you two theories already about why they moved around. One was the affair of uh, you know, Prince George IV, uh, rather King George the fourth and the other was the affair of like you know the fact that uh, they had uh, they had no actual property within England and so they had to kind of move around uh, there's also the uh, theory that all three children and in fact even their father suffered from asthma and um, 
certainly uh, Richard's life was very marked by periods of chronic illness. Um, at a very early age, he had, uh, you know, developed this toy tendency to bear whatever pain uh, his body was putting him through. But it wasn't just asthma. He had, I think, uh, a tooth abscess at a young age, so much so that people would not know what had happened until like the, his entire cheek uh, was swollen and hurt and he would not say anything to his family. He would just like bear the pain. Uh, later on in life, uh, he had to actually take leave from the army because uh, for six months and he went off to the Nilgiris because he had developed uh, ophthalmia from possibly uh, an STD. Uh, and ophthalmia means you kind of cannot see for periods of time almost. Um, so he was very acutely uh, aware of the pain and illness that his body was putting him through. Uh, but he tried to overcome that and he tried to sort of be extremely stoic when it came to, you know, for example, during the Nile expedition, a javelin went through his cheek almost entirely. And what happened was that the, the javelin entered through one cheek and sort of pierced the other. And uh, uh, that left a permanent sort of scar on his face because he had to pull the javelin out himself and then had to wait to get it stitched up because he was being attacked at the time, obviously. So uh, they had to go, like they had to go a certain amount of days before finding a doctor. That left a very noticeable scar on his cheek, which like forever uh, kind of marked his face. And he was sort of very sensitive about that. Um, but he wore all these illnesses and ailments uh, very stoically. He didn't, uh, like it was a badge of honor for him, in fact, to have gone through all of this. Um, and as, as I said, as a fencer, he was, uh, he was given to obviously uh, wounds and injuries while fencing. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I believe while fencing once he, he pierced his brother's uh, soft palate in his mouth. Uh, the top of the mouth, basically. And uh, even that was then sort of a, a wound that remained with Edward, his brother, uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, so they were, they were not a very healthy family. Um, but as I said, like, it, like Richard's life is almost an example of living with chronic illness, but not really giving in to that and like trying to push yourself and push your body to you know its limit so that you could achieve things and do things and gain fame and gain notoriety so so you know uh, i wait let me let me go back so i spoke about how richard never really fitted in um, thanks to his sort of education and his um, like constant moving around. And what ended up happening was that he, when time came for him to start at Oxford, I don't know why, but his father had the sort of misbegotten idea that, you know, Richard would make a fine reverend because there had been some, you know, clergyman in the family on the Burton side. <laughs> and he, he thought Richard should go to Trinity College and you know study there and of course richard uh, had a uh, had a great affinity for languages so by this time he had practically learned almost mm -hmm. all the uh, the, the sort of latin romance based languages and he had uh, you know he had good greek he had good latin uh, so he uh, while he was at oxford started his study of arabic in fact um, and he got fairly proficient in it, but what happened in Oxford was that the uh, the climate of like sort of you know the culture of like you know you uh, your your dons or your advisors are the be all and end all of your entire duration there. Uh, there was something about that that really stuck in his craw, and he did not want to submit to authority. So there are numerous instances where you know, he would uh, go uh, off and attend some race or something, or like, you know, not come into class or not check in with his, you know, sort of superiors. 
and his general like there was no one specific sort of incident but generally he had a disdain for his classmates and his uh, you know teachers most of them at least so he sort of felt that there was nothing they could teach him because he had practically already learned most of what he had uh, most of what they were doing so there was this idea of you know um for him being an outsider being an outlier and he ended up being rusticated uh from oxford which means like you're sent down you know you're not given the chance to sit for your exams and things like that uh what ended up happening also was that you know uh his uh, you know he was rusticated for a sh- like a duration uh but his father basically was like well that's it i'm fed up of your you know escapades and stuff so go join the army now because there is no other like future for you if you want to keep doing these sorts of things basically which is an, what richard ended up doing uh, there is in fact a, a later letter that was sent from oxford to richard's father saying that like well his period of rustication was over and that he could rejoin if he wished to and either his father did not deliberately did not tell him so that he would not know and not return to oxford uh, or he told him and richard chose not to return to oxford either way uh, the life of an academic was sort of like life of formal academia let's put it that way because he definitely was an academic but the life of formal academia was forever sort of shuttered um to him because of this sort of period of his life and uh, he did as many uh, as many recruits to the army do which is that like they uh, kind of uh, throw their lot in and be like a, you know like whatever happens happens you know like it's on fate now um at this time very crucially the first afghan war had begun um there were news of there was news of mcnaughton there was news of alexander burns you know everything that had happened uh, in kabul and the re- the disastrous retreat from kabul where the entire british army got ex- exterminated and only one fellow supposedly survived um and what ended up happening was that you know uh, richard sort of got it into his head that you know he could make a difference and he was you know raring to go and he wanted to go to the you know afghan front and so when he sort of signed up he was quite like he was a great deal older than most of the recruits because at that time everybody pretty much came to india at the age of 16 uh the young recruits were called griffins and uh, they were called griffins because you know they were sort of young but adventurous and raring to go and uh, they they were uh, you know given one to two years of instruction typically and then packed off uh, with their kit you had to buy your own kit like your own uniform your everything everything that you had the army gave you nothing uh, you had to buy all your stuff and you were sort of given the choice of a commission at you know depending on how much money you had you had to buy your commission and uh, basically richard could have gone to the bengal army because as i said he had relatives in calcutta who were pretty highly placed uh, but he chose the bombay presidency army uh, and like his father was an army man um uh, infantry man because his father was in the 31st foot the 35th foot uh, and he was in i think the 14th and the 18th uh, native infantry he shifted from the 14th to the 18th but you know uh that became his sort of um uh, you know alumna <laughs> you know the the regiment that he's associated with basically uh although he didn't do much with that regiment as we will come to see so anyway uh so here is here is richard significantly older than most of the people that went out to india and because of the afghan war and the serious damages that the british army had faced they needed to replenish um the army 
so they, they were in fact calling up any young able bodied man who was willing to go off to you know the orient and face the barbarians of afghanistan and you know sort of like this was the party line so like several boys who had no clue of what they were joining up for uh, were also with him and he remarks rather condescendingly in his diary of like looking around and seeing these sort of you know yokels like <laughs> to him it would have been like being surrounded by rednecks because these were all like county boys who were not really educated in a public school and didn't really have the manners of gentlemen uh, so he was sort of uh, horrified at the company that he was expected to keep and that also sort of played into his attitude when he landed in india as we will come to that because uh, he did mix somewhat with his sort of regiment but for the most part he was too busy learning and studying languages or surveying like he was sent out for the sin survey um to do much with his fellow regiment uh, regimental members like he he wasn't he wasn't that uh, friendly and sort of kept to himself uh, much of the time because he sort of disdained the typical sort of um activities of like go out and hunt or go out and attend a notch or just you know sort of uh, do nothing um for most of the day uh which you know for him felt very weird and strange and abhorrent so he gave over his entire time to studying um when he was in india especially studying languages which was to have a huge impact later on when he started um because of this this language studies he started collecting manuscripts in native languages over the period of 30 years he collected numerous manuscripts which then sort of became the basis of the later translations of the scented garden uh arabian nights kama sutra various other sort of uh, you know translated passages when when it came to the arabian nights for example he was working off of the macaulay translation which is called the calcutta translation but he had several other manuscripts with him uh that he had procured from here or there um all of this collection of course was destroyed by his wife after his death so the sad fact is that we actually have no first hand papers of richard unless they were either sent to somebody else or given to somebody else and that person preserved it because everything that was in his personal private collection barring a few few odd odds and ends everything that was in his personal collection and who was not already published was basically destroyed by his wife including the draft of an uh, another book that he had already um arranged for printing before he died he was going to come out with a follow up to the scented garden um the perfume garden sorry so basically um isabel his wife uh, i will come again i will come to her later but due to her sort of morality due to her fears of uh, you know a public scandal if people found out about his papers the she ended up actually destroying his sort of life's work uh, and several other rare collections of manuscripts that he had sort of gathered together and put together so as a consequence a lot of his early life remains a question mark because of this reason and in some cases it's put to rights by his um, sister's family where they they sort of thought of the recollections of you know their mother and sort of put that down and published it but mostly um thanks to isabel's burning of everything uh there remains actually like kind of jigsaw puzzle effect where you have to piece together what he was doing from letters to other people uh that survived with them uh, we don't have the letters that he received also from other people because uh those letters were also burnt basically everything was burnt so anyway he set out for india uh, this was he he left india on june 18th 1842 
he was on board the ship John Knox, which set out from England. This is the kind of ship. This is not the John Knox, but it was the John Knox was a sailing bark which sort of um, took him from England to India. Uh, the the ship didn't have much in the way of company. As I said, he didn't really care to mix with sort of his fellow people. His two major activities, major activities, I mean, obviously there were other things like fishing mm -hmm. and so on, but uh, the major activities on board ship, and this was like a four to five month journey sort of uh, that they went through. Uh, they, they passed the time by either boxing, like sort of boxing against the ship's mates and the captain and so on, on board ship. So uh, Richard really loved that because he, as usual, loved like martial sports and things, and he liked to see how much sort of pain he could take. Um, uh, so he was boxing on board ship with the ship's mates and so on. Or he had discovered a lady who was sailing to India, but she had, like, she had already like hired native servants. So there were three Indians on board that ship. And that is when he started learning Hindustani, basically. Uh, he sat down and within four to five months, he had already sort of gotten a head start on every single other ensign because you were supposed to pass exams in languages, even as a soldier uh, in the Indian army. And uh, this was sort of uh, almost like a running start that he took. In fact, his later teacher who was a Parsi gentleman, uh, who taught him uh, Persian and so on. This Parsi gentleman uh, <laughs> famously remarked that his student could learn a language running. You know, like you could, you could give him a, a very a small head start and he could immediately sort of just grasp and not just grasp the language, but like speak the various nuances and dialects that the natives sort of uh, had picked up. Also, so you know, you could you could talk like a merchant, you could talk like a fakir, like that was the difference in the way he would pick up small changes of mannerisms. So extremely gifted in that aspect. Um, on board the ship was also, I must mention this because there are a bunch of dog lovers in the audience. I think uh, on board ship was his uh, uh, dog that he had brought out, um, you know, uh, to, I think it was a female bull terrier and uh, he brought this dog out uh, to India where it sort of became like his regimental favorite uh, dog and then this bull terrier was so popular that like it lived to a ripe old age and died in Gujarat uh, where he was where his regiment was and um, the the sort of uh, the future lineage of this bull terrier like existed for multiple generations. In fact, when when Richard sort of swung by Bombay again during the Royal Darbar, um, you know, uh, not Darbar, the the Prince of Wales's visit to India, um, he recalls like that the sort of the the babies of his bitch were flourishing in India. In fact, there was like a uh, uh, one of the children was called Bachchan, <laughs> uh, which was little one. Uh, and like apparently Bachchan used to be a famous rat catcher and would go out and hunt jackals by itself, you know, early in the morning. Uh, and apparently died in a similar state where like it was hunting and it was injured and, you know, they could not administer the medicine to it or something of that sort. So uh, this is just a small little footnote, but like I thought it was interesting and I'm sure like there are a bunch of dog lovers in the chat who would be interested to know this. Um, the, as I said, he was originally appointed to the 14th. He transferred to the 18th. He arrived in Bombay, October 28, 1842. Um, this was what Bombay Harbor looked like around that time. This is actually slightly, slightly later, but not that much later. These are all sort of contemporary images that I'm showing you all, but like uh, Bombay at that time, you know, uh, was very much not this grand vista or whatever that you would see approaching Bombay today. It was uh, a very chaotic harbor situation. 
and uh, when the boat sort of the bark pulled in and the pilot came on board uh, they they were dying for news of the afghan war and they asked him uh, the, they asked the pilot what had happened and the pilot like told them that the afghan war was over because you know they had they had sent in the army of retribution and uh, you know pretty much everything was over and done with there was no glory to be had in fights so basically like uh, in any battle rather so there was this great sense of disappointment especially as richard writes later like that he he almost like went right back to the <laughs> ship because he was so disappointed by bombay by not being able to fight in battle and not get glory and you know he he was of half a mind to just get right back on the ship and sail back to england but he ended up not doing that and his first couple of months in bombay was spent uh, again being ill because as soon as he got off the ship he commented on the fact that you know it was so chaotic and um, he found the 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 native infantry uh, uniform on the natives which like at that time looked like a lungi uh, with a, a english red coat on top uh he found to, that to be extremely ridiculous and he found uh that he was ill because of the shoddy hotel that he had stayed at and bombay famously had very bad hotels and uh, the the british hotel the so called british hotel that he stayed at was actually owned by an englishman but run by parsis as were most hotels at that time uh and it was so bad that he naturally got a stomach upset like within the first couple of weeks and had to be shifted out to the esplanade so basically he fell ill almost immediately as soon as he uh, came in to india and spent some time recovering and then joined his uh, regiment which was at that time posted at baroda and then bhuj and then sind so we will follow that later but this is just a view of bombay as it was at the time uh it was not a very large uh sort of colony uh they had only just managed to sort of wrest control of most of the places from the portuguese um there was you know there was still there was still much to be developed basically at the time so this is an earlier picture of bombay harbor but this is more clear and you can see sort of uh, in black and white that whereas this is this is from 1850 something this this particular image uh this one is from the 1700s but there is not much uh, you don't see much change in terms of the buildings or the expansion and the port or anything of the sort basically this is this is pretty much like pretty much as it was so this is in the late or mid 1700s when this particular picture was made um this is another picture of the harbor and sort of the chaos of the harbor as you can see i i wanted to share this image because <laughs> even again even though this is slightly later uh you can see an elephant almost bodily being picked up uh, in this right hand corner uh, by a harness or something and being loaded onto a ship and you can imagine being an englishman <laughs> you can imagine being an englishman sort of arriving and into this chaos and seeing like elephants being bodily <laughs> sort of roped onto a ship so you know uh this is obviously very foreign and uh, strange to anybody that sort of uh, would have just come from england and to land into this sort of chaotic mess and uh, richard did like it but he also sort of was uh, uh, disturbed by how much like how how little there was to do and how much boredom he felt he was very sort of um in the first few months he he was sort of uh, extremely upset by the fact that there was not much to do uh, apart from say hunting or going you know being invited out for dinner every now and then 
so he set about learning the language and you know passing the exams uh, and this was a twofold thing one was to kill the boredom that he felt and the second was that he knew that uh, his his success depended on sort of his facility with languages because if you had languages you could have any number of future avenues open to you even as part of the army you could uh, become the official translator to your regiment which he ended up becoming uh, you could you know if you were exceptionally good you could end up uh, joining the surveyors which he also ended up doing um, and he uh, i i imagine he had designs uh, to become a political agent or sort of you know ascend in that direction but of course you know um, internal issues with uh, you know the higher ups and with certain members of the government prevented that from happening so you know uh, i think he had it in his head that if he learned languages and learned them well uh, he could sort of rise in the ranks and not just be a uh, you know cannon fodder um, as it were so i think again like i think to a certain extent he would have been uh, inspired by the stories of alexander burns because uh, alexander burns famously also learned a number of languages and was able to converse very fluently and as alexander burns went into kabul and bukhara in disguise as a merchant so would burton end up doing first in sin and then later in mecca so this is like the early part of burton's life i will obviously not touch you know anything that comes outside bombay presidency because you know that is a long and extremely sort of uh, well well documented phase uh, of his life but this early sort of parts are the things that sort of people often skip over but they are a crucial sort of uh, they are a crucial uh, factor in uh what he was to become this is where he learned all the skills that he would apply later in life this is where he learned all the languages that he would and and give the examinations uh that you know would sort of uh, be employed later in life all the skills that he learned in translating and learning languages and so on and so forth so uh most biographies of burton sort of skip right over his time in the army uh apart from the karachi brothel report because that is the only sort of salacious thing that uh, keeps being brought up i will come to that later but uh, most reports of his life or most biographies skip right over this part um in his life and uh, it, that's a shame because it's an area that's very open to research and interestingly it's also an area where uh the prevalence of Uh, the area where the prevalence of uh, the or rather the lack of documents or finding new documents on new papers uh, the chances are extremely sort of uh, high because uh, a number of his papers were mislaid entire book manuscripts were mislaid when he left the bombay army and sort of started his journeys of exploration into you know africa so uh, uh, famously his zanzibar book the manuscript for that was found like some 40 years later uh, in a storage box at the asiatic society and it was then sort of sent back to him saying oh i believe these are your uh, these are your manuscripts so the the chances of finding or locating some sort of um, research material that has not been uh, found prior to this are extremely high uh in this case are we good on time i think it's 8 o'clock okay. all right so here we are in bombay and he's learning uh persian he's learning obviously hindustani but also dialects uh he ends up uh trying to immerse himself in the culture to such an extent that he also starts learning from religious um features 
because he wants to explore the nuances of like why why certain mannerisms or rituals uh, persisted in india and you know why was somebody dressed a certain way why did somebody have certain marks on their body and so on and so forth so he employed um, you know someone to teach him the quran and he became a hafiz which is uh, someone who has learned the quran by heart and uh, he also employed a nagar brahmin to teach him uh, everything about hinduism and they say that again one of the tall tales around burton's life because this is not verifiable but he says that the nagar brahmin that he was learning from was so impressed by his ability to pick up the nuances of hinduism that he in, inducted him with the janeo ceremony like he gave him the thread uh, the holy thread so this is again uh, part of his uh, education that he picked up in bombay and then applied later on because um uh, like for instance with learning the quran when he made his journey into mecca uh, he was able to pose as an indian muslim uh, because you know of the the way that he was so, so what happened was that a lot of his um a lot of his uh, quirky mannerisms or like mistakes uh was sort of excused by the people the, by the caravan that he was traveling with at the time because they they thought that yeah well he uh he's probably an indian muslim so he does they do things differently in india and that's how he was sort of taught and that's what he kind of learned and pretended to be uh very crucially also with the karachi brothel report he went undercover um as either a fakir or some other sort of Uh, uh disguise as sometimes as a merchant uh to sort of uh prepare this report um which is now the subject of great controversy um there there are <laughs> there are numerous people who have tried to search for it some people say it doesn't exist some people say it existed but it was destroyed um we don't know the truth as because as with all things richard burton uh, a lot of things contradict each other and there is a great deal of again myth making uh, around this sort of aspect so anyway by by his entire period in sort of bombay and not within bombay itself he, um, when i say bombay i mean bombay presidency um he had almost picked up pretty much all of the languages marathi gujarati you know hindustani and persian that he would come to use later in life this is one of the maps of bombay that uh, uh ostensibly belonged to richard burton this is one of his few sort of surviving pieces of ephemera that documents that he had sorry i think my voice is going by this time <laughs> um you can if like you can see a high res version of this later on i will give you all the link if you all need it but um, i think brinal might be in the group so he might know also because this was shared by him as well if he's not i shall drop the link uh but <laughs> but basically uh the the map of bombay uh, that you see here uh, is post the 1920s because uh sorry 1820s because uh, the lunatic asylum at kolaba has already been sort of built and the causeway has already been built and that was i think in the 1820s so this definitely take like is a map um which he might have bought or um uh, kept uh but you know definitely uh like one of his few sort of surviving documents from this period of his life because what would happen is that you know he would be posted to town of course he would take all his examinations at the asiatic okay not within the asiatic but at the town hall so to speak um and you know for that he would have to travel all the way sort of up the coast by a small boat all right um and called a patamar because it's it's basic patamars are basically nothing more than like a miniature dhao 
or like you know one of those uh, old style sailing boats you might see even sometimes up and down the konkan coast these days but um, you know it was a it was a, it was a, a journey because you would have to come down from the coast of gujarat uh, because it was a smaller boat you had to put in every night meaning you had to dock every night and camp and then kind of get back on the boat the next day in the morning and then keep sailing and then dock again at night so it was a very sort of interrupted journey um and he would come down regularly almost like like within within the space of 3 to 4 months he would come down at least twice to like take exams in the various languages that he did so well, it's it's actually like a measure of dedication that he was so focused on getting his um sort of certifications uh with such frequency that you know he was ready to make this sort of um, long and arduous journey up and down the coast of bombay basically um and this is like the fort area um i don't know if you can see my cursor but where it is hovering right now was the native town and the fort itself was here and we will see sort of maps of what that looked like Uh, coming up but basically these would have been the two main places where he would have spent the maximum amount of time apart from his regimental headquarters in gujarat um so this is one second this is an 1840 map of the fort of bombay and keep in mind uh, you know burton landed in 1842 so it wouldn't have looked very different from this particular view so this is almost as contemporary as it gets uh this is you know fort george uh this is where his examinations would have happened at the town hall right and basically uh this is this is sort of where he would have been put up at the barracks um and he would have walked around these streets trying to learn sort of the language of the bazaar and like learn native sort of uh, native idioms and expressions uh this entire portion that you see here exiting the fort basically um this would have been the church gate so uh, there's a there's a really uh, good talk on maps that minal has done um i urge everyone to sort of uh, take a look at that but basically i won't go over that again but basically this sort of road was the one that led out and this road actually both of these sort of led out into the native town and he does mention spending on you know quite a few evenings in the native town uh, especially the red light district and sort of learning uh, different things uh within the native town itself so it wasn't just that he spent all his time cooped up amongst the english within the fort he used to go out and he used to do a lot of uh you know uh as we would say like be a flaneur like walk around and it sort of soak in the atmosphere and soak in the sights so this is the fort of bombay in 40 and the next one would have been the native town so this is for george as i pointed out in earlier so this this sort of area here is what this would have been here exactly so um he had he had spent time on the esplanade camping because uh he fell ill quite often so he found the air in the esplanade better than being cooped up in the barracks or you know renting a house somewhere so he just generally felt better camping but he i mean he he sort of disliked being so close to the city anyway um this is you know of course uh your kalba devi and you know kamatipura and all of that so uh, um kamatipura specifically finds mention here is kamatipura it specifically finds mention in his uh diaries of that time about how in the evening certain dark eyed persons would you know sort of give entertainment to the soldiers and of course um, uh, i'm pretty sure that uh, whatever he picked up uh in his later editions of 
the Kama Sutra also sort of date back to his experiences here within the red light area of Bombay. So this is this is completed to 1855, but you know if you had maps, uh, like if if you were if you were a map maker at the time, uh, making accurate maps took years. So in all likelihood, uh, not much would have changed from the 1840s when Richard Burton was in Bombay to 1855 when this map was finally sort of published and you know printed. So. Uh, uh, you can say this is almost contemporary uh, at the time that he was here, even though there's a difference of about um, 10 to 12 years uh, between the time that he left Bombay and, you know, this man being sort of made. But you can say it's near contemporary. So it gives you at least a good idea of like what the both the native town and the town of Bombay would have looked like at the time. Both of these maps, the earlier one, as well as this one, are available in extremely high resolution. So if anyone is actually interested in trying to figure out, uh, you know, places uh, and, you know, uh, sort of like charting out exactly where and what he did, because it's possible to do that to uh, almost like a day by day breakdown. Uh, it's possible to sort of sit with these two high resolution versions of this and sort of plan out exactly where he went, what he did uh, on any given day during the time that his diary sort of uh, cover. And now this is this is Sin or Sin. Uh, this was added to the presidency of Bombay uh, fairly later uh, because you know once. Once the once the Afghan wars were fought, once the uh, the Sikh wars were Anglo Sikh wars were fought, what ended up happening is that the territories that were sort of controlled by both Ranjit Singh and the Amirs of Sindh were sort of uh, taken from them and put in because what had happened is that already during uh, the Afghan war. The, both the army of the Indus and the army of retribution had stationed themselves using Sindh as a jumping off point. And for that, they had put pressure on both Ranjit Singh and the, you know, the local armies of Sindh or the Mirs of Sindh. Uh, what ended up happening is then these sort of became permanent stations for the British. And they ended up sort of claiming territory uh, once Ranjit Singh died and they had fought the anglo Sikh wars and all of that. So. Uh, the power vacuum after Ranjit Singh's death and the fact that uh, they already had marched a uh, number of, uh, you know, regiments through this entire territory ended up sort of then annexing uh, this area. So as you, this is a later map uh, from the Imperial Gazette, but uh, the, the Sin division was sort of lumped into the Bombay presidency. And you had divisions of the Bombay presidency, the Northern Division Central, so on and so forth. But Sindh was its own sort of special division, which was administered by Bombay and the court, et cetera, was in Bombay. But, you know, uh, the Bombay army was stationed in Sindh. You find some several regiments that eventually then became uh, sort of having Sindh as their headquarters, basically, from the Bombay army. So, uh, his regiment ended up being one of them. Um, uh, the famous sort of, uh, while, while Burton was mostly stationed in and around Karachi, uh, his, he, his regiment did go up to Sakhar. Um, he, he was given the task of a uh, number of uh, sort of ethnographic reports, as they say, when he was in Sim. Uh, that was because of this fellow. Uh, Charles James Napier. Uh, this is almost in like exactly contemporary with Burton. Uh, the 1843 was like when Sindh was finally sort of amalgamated and annexed into the uh, company's holdings in India. And the subjugation of Sindh was carried out by this fellow. And he was a very, himself a very colorful looking character, as you can see. Uh, that's him in English dress and in native Indian dress, as they would say. But basically, uh, this fellow 
was Burton's senior most commanding officer, basically. And he had a huge impact on uh, the kind of work that Burton did. And also a huge impact on what would become Burton's military career, basically. So Burton, in fact, uh, sent him a number of early copies of his books uh, as, a, as a sort of mark of his regard. Um, in a lot of his early books uh, uh, dealt with subjects in and around, you know, uh, what he had learned in India. So uh, he did send a bunch of those copies to Napier. I don't know if he kept them or not, but he does mention the fact that he dedicated um, a few of them to his experience with the Bombay Army. And uh, he, Napier gave him the uh, mandate that he was to survey um, a number of areas and he was to uh, compile a list of uh, uh, sort of medicinal plants. And in the case of Burton, it was to compile a list of intoxicant plants and uh, the effects of those said plants upon, you know, the physical, um, you know, the, the physical body, um, which he duly did. And, you know, the paper exists and survives uh, to this date. You can read it. Uh, the, the, this is where the most famous sort of controversy during his time in India comes about, which is the Karat, Karachi Brothel report. Like he was given the mandate by Napier. Uh, apparently Napier felt that uh, a number of uh, soldiers from the army were spending too much time in the brothels, particularly male brothels. And uh, he needed someone to go in and basically undercover compile a report of how many officers frequented such places, uh, what were the services that were rendered at such places, and uh, like basically a description of the different kinds of sex work that took place in uh, Karachi. And uh, this was meant to be uh, like his first sort of undercover operation. Uh, or so he says. Again, very difficult to tell because no such report survives. Many biographers have tried to look for it. Uh, there are hints about it in letters because of course one did not write about such things openly. So there are several sort of hints uh, in different official letters back and forth about you know, Burton and this and that, but nothing concrete survives. So this is a fiction that has persisted to this date and whether it actually has basis in fact is uh, like is left to be seen because as i said like nothing survives uh, in either they were destroyed due to prevailing morality but that's sort of difficult to believe because there are other reports of similar like of a similar nature that uh, also survive to this day and it's very hard to uh, understand why his report was singled out for some reason unless it was also because of the fact that he had taken uh, various grudges against the Bombay government uh, officials. And uh, so that they probably ended up destroying the report out of that particular aspect of it. Very hard to tell. This is an area which is extremely ripe for research. If any of you are inclined to do so, I highly suggest that tracking this particular you know, piece of work down or even like sort of tracking down mentions or uh, the actual document itself or even correspondence relating to that document would be a great achievement in terms of research. Um, so you can definitely go figure out this mystery uh, on your own time. <laughs> but anyway, so Napier was his like mentor figure, so to speak, and Napier had Napier had ambitions to set up um, SIN as a separate sort of cohort away from both the Bengal government um, directives and the Bombay government directives, because I think in Napier's head, he felt that like he operated better without um, some officials sitting in Bombay or some officials sitting in Calcutta. Uh, could give orders that, you know, 
were kind of pointless. Like he Napier felt that he understood the natives much better than any of these like sort of government bureaucratic kind of people. So he set up the Sindh Association, of which I think Burton was uh, the treasurer or the secretary or something like that. And the Sindh Association endeavored to carry out a number of sort of studies of the area of Sindh. But of course, what they were actually doing was also uh, participating in the great game because all of these reports then became compiled into uh, official dossiers that went out and, you know, uh, various spy masters in various cities then took note of these reports coming out of Sindh and sort of uh, planned the great game or like what the spy network was called the great game in India, they planned out moves as per the reports coming out of the Sindh Association. And uh, several uh, several letters by Burton to the Bombay Times, in fact, exist, uh, where he uh, argues for or against certain um, assumptions made about Sindh. Um, they, they are very interesting to read. I, again, urge people to look them up. Um, they are... Uh, they, they are sort of, uh, again, like for an officer on the rise, uh, in the army back then, you didn't have opinions. You didn't, you didn't write things. You did your job as a soldier. Uh, he, he very much possesses evidence of critical thinking skills and like half a brain, which, you know, uh, back then it was like, oh, well, soldiering, soldiering is not a thinking man's job. Soldiering was like, you go out and you do your duty and you know, you either win a medal or you fall in battle, you know, which is probably what his brother ended up doing. Uh, but Richard's, Richard's mind sort of worked, uh, worked in that direction where he would question why things were the way they were and he would, you know, sort of bring up certain, what he felt were certain injustices. And so naturally this displeased a lot of people and they kind of had their eye on him and marked him out as an insubordinate officer. They, they did give him commendations for his work and for his facility with languages, but they knew that this is a troublemaker basically. And so this is why he probably didn't advance much despite having Napier as like a mentor figure. Um, he grew sort of, uh, as I said, he probably had an STD, which resulted in ophthalmia, but he also grew sort of really weary of the same sort of um, documented work that he did, which was like surveying and languages and so on. Um, several of his friends uh, transferred to other regiments and, you know, one glory in like the Sobrao battle, basically, or won medals and so on and so forth. But he was stuck uh, with his regiment uh, because they didn't send him out because he was part of the surveyors uh, and he had valuable skills. So they were not exactly gonna put him at the front lines and like risk losing him in battle. So he was held back from battle several times and he got pretty sick of it. And in fact, there's a letter from his father writing to you know, a bunch of officials in India saying that, you know, I have faced uh, frontline action. Uh, my son is uh, having to hear allegations that he is purposely being, uh, like that he has, he has asked to be withheld from the frontline and that's not true. He wishes to be at the front lines, but he's being held back by other people and so on and so forth. So this sort of, um, this sort of uh, uh, internal politics and machinations uh, kind of got to him. And as I said, the, uh, the, the sort of irritating factor was that people from his own regiment uh, won medals at different battles and he wasn't able to win much uh, in terms of like glory. So he requested a leave of absence, uh, which was approved. He ended up traveling to Goa and he ended up traveling to the Nilgiris. That became the basis of a really famous book uh, called uh, Goa or the Blue Mountains. And uh, you can read that online if you would like um, links to the book. I shall drop them in the chat or drop them later. You can get in touch with me. But 
it's a it's a fascinating sort of um, study of like the the uh, Goan or the Portuguese culture at that time uh, in from his point of view. Uh, he was very taken with uh, a Portuguese poet, Luis de Camões, which, you know, uh, uh, Camões became the sort of poet, the earliest poets of poet of in like Portuguese India. He wrote he wrote a famous book, uh, like in a verse book called the Luisiads, which Burton ended up translating. Um, and this is sort of where he faced the idea that being with the army was not doing much. So he requested a leave of absence to go visit his sister in Italy at the time, which is when this portrait was painted. And when he was in Italy, he probably got it into his head that he had to do something on his own. He was not going to get very far just being an army man and soldiering. This is where like, like post recovering, you know, uh, in, in the Nilgiris and then post after that going off uh, to Europe. When he came back from Europe after his leave was when he applied for the journey to Mecca. And that is where the sort of actual legends of Richard Burton begins because he came back from this like sort of recuperation and rest with like a very firm idea of I want to be solo, I want to be an adventurer, and I don't want to be part of the army, I don't want to be part of the political structure. He did not care. So this is when he started preparing for his solo trip in disguise into Mecca, pretty much the same way that uh, Alexander Burns had done a solo trip into Kabul in disguise as a merchant uh, with, with uh, an Indian, a fellow partner called Mohanlal Kashmiri. And Richard Burton, of course, had uh, with him an Indian sort of, uh, uh, not really a servant, but kind of like a man at arms uh, that stuck with him for the rest of his life, basically. So after this point, this is sort of like, uh, I think in this portrait, Richard is around 27 or 28. So this is the point where he like left the soldiering life behind and started to become the famous explorer that everybody knew. Uh, you know, post his trip to Mecca, yeah, post his trip to Mecca, he uh, ended up doing the Zanzibar uh, trip, but he wrote about that. And then sort of the papers went missing from Aden. Uh, Post, post the Mecca trip and post the return from Italy, he uh, had also already collected the documentation for the translation of the Arabian Nights, but he was not going to publish that until much later in life. Um, he ended up going to Zanzibar, he ended up going to uh, Harare, he ended up uh, going, uh, trying to find the source of the Nile on two separate aborted trips, which were sort of, very ill starred, like there was, there were many unfortunate incidences on that trip, uh, including, as I said, him getting attacked by a bunch of Somali warriors who threw a javelin right through his cheek. You can see the scar in this famous portrait of him by Lord Leighton, it's called the Leighton portrait. Um, this was done slightly later in life, but uh, you, this is, this is the most sort of famous uh, image that survives of uh, Richard Burton to this day. Um, in, in each of them, you can sort of see the uh, steely-eyed determination that this man had. And, you know, uh, uh, not just the Africa trip, but he ended up going to um, America and lived with the Mormons for a while. He ended up going to Brazil. He ended up... Uh, also joining the Bashi Bazooks um, in uh, Gallipoli, I think uh, there was a, there was an unfortunate incident at Damascus where he he was um, uh, sort of given strict uh, sort of almost court martial to an extent where he disobeyed his superior officers. All these were later exploits um, that came about as he was trying to carve a name for himself 
in a solo fashion. Uh, but what ended up happening is after all of these sort of adventures, misadventures, he realized that like other people were sort of, uh, you know, for example, his, uh, his uh, partner on the Nile trip had already published a book almost like as soon as he got back to England while Richard was off doing more adventurers, adventuring things. Uh, and what ended up happening was that other people sort of went to publish things uh, a lot faster than he had been doing uh, because he would prepare extensive notes, but then also get distracted and go off on another adventure and another adventure and so on. So what ended up happening was that he actually started publishing quite late in life. I believe he realized that like he had uh, a number of interesting narratives, but uh, you know other people had sort of tried to take the glory from him. So he started with the publication of you know his trip to the Nile, and then once he had like finished with the publications of all his different expeditions and trips, uh, the the Mecca trip and all of that, he realized that he could publish uh, translations of all the uh, manuscripts and documents that he had collected while he was in India. Um, and so he published uh, translations. And this, these, when you say published, it I, I kind of mean self-published because a lot of the publications that Richard put out could be termed obscenity by the laws of that era. So what ended up happening is that they would form private clubs uh, where you would subscribe uh, to be part of the club and then you would get a copy of the book basically so it could not be termed obscenity because you had sort of opted in to buy the book uh, privately circulated books were free of such laws but it was a very risky and fine line that Richard Burton walked there were numerous sort of insinuations that he actually uh, enjoyed sort of homosexuality uh, because he came up with the description of like the sodatic zone, uh, which sort of implied that there's a belt in the tropical regions, like like across the earth, where homosexuality was sort of looked upon as normal, uh, and it wasn't something, uh, you know, sort of frowned upon. And that the further you got away from like the equator or the tropical areas, uh, the more homosexuality was frowned upon. So this was his attempts at sort of early uh, racial profiling, I would say. Um, this is where the documents sort of mention this sort of, uh, uh, not exactly, I, I wouldn't say racism, because he didn't find it wrong, but he certainly found it like, like, it was an assumption, you cannot just say a certain area is more prone to homosexuality than others, basically. So uh, this was his sort of uh, great contributions in terms of uh, history and literature. Of course, the Arabian Nights were the ones that caught everybody's attention. And for years on end, then there were various uh, Arabian inspired and Arabian uh, uh, kind of influenced things. In fact, all the way up to the you know, 1920s, 1930s you can find references to Burton himself. Uh, Rudolf, Rudolf Valentino modeled himself on what he thought Burton's descriptions of like being a sheikh uh, were like, basically. So uh, like the impact and the efforts that Burton put into studying the East uh, were definitely, I would say, uh, uh, very influential towards uh, Western concepts of Orientalism and were kind of the foundational basis of the later mania that kind of engulfed people about like Oriental Arabic things, basically, like the, the, the Sheikh series of movies that Valentino went through, as I said, Lawrence of Arabia, um, even sort of uh, the description of Mecca that he gives there were other travelers who had gone into Mecca, but he was the one that had actually uh, uh, sort of given the most extensive description of it uh, without even being able to take notes because you know you could not like 
I don't know if you've seen uh, what pilgrims to Mecca wear, but it is not much like most of the chest is left open. Um, you could not take notes, but he described the tawaf really uh, extensively. His uh, sort of descriptions were later, uh, uh, again, as I said, all of his books and surveys and descriptions were later sort of sent around to various governmental offices uh, to use in like their intelligence reports. And this basically like was his contribution towards quote unquote empire. He was not interested in conquering land for the sake of England. He didn't even want to sort of be uh, the ruler of said lands. Uh, but definitely empire building happened uh, to a great extent because of his reports and books and you know the the sort of famous celebrity personality that he became he, to such an extent that you know uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Bram Stoker, even uh, that fellow who wrote the Fu Manchu series of novels, all of them extremely orientalist stereotypes, but Bram Stoker particularly recalls sitting across from Richard Burton um, in a carriage. Uh, this is before he had written Dracula and sort of coming uh, coming face to face with the incredible force of his personality and remarking upon that aspect, his eyes, the way he looked sternly and hard and cold at you, you know. So he was he was an influential figure, not just by the force of his life, but also by the impact that he then had on other people who read or uh, read his works or read about him, and then sort of came about. Uh, you know, uh, in their own ways towards exploring the East. So definitely this is, this is where it all started. It all started in Bombay uh, or rather in the Bombay presidency. And then of course, uh, Richard's travel took him all over the world. He ended up marrying Isabel. Uh, he ended up uh, living to a ripe old age and getting, you know, the status of a diplomatic consul in Trieste. And uh, he died in his bed. He didn't die a violent death. Um, on his deathbed, there's a famous incident where his wife supposedly converted him to Catholicism. Uh, we, I mean, she did call a priest and we don't know if like it was a conversion, but Richard himself didn't really have uh, opinions on religion as such. So like, I, I don't, like at, at best he would have been an agnostic. He studied religions, but he did not actively sort of participate in it. Uh, he was not interested in converting the natives of Africa, so to speak, uh, nor was he interested in like converting anybody in Cairo or so on. So uh, he was not, as I said, like interested in pushing the agenda of empire. He was just like an iconoclast himself. Uh, so that is sort of a very small part of his life. I urge you all to read up on him. There are several books that I can name uh, if you are so inclined to do so. Uh, but I think we are sort of running short on time and now I shall wrap this up. And if anyone has any questions, let me know in the chat or so on. But I think we'll sort of call it a day over here. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Asiatic Society, Shamanalwala, Ramesh, my mother, for helping with all these things. And um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. But before I stop sharing the screen, this is a picture of his study um, at his final sort of home. Uh, this is him sitting at his desk and writing. And this is the rest of sort of the back end of this sort of room where uh, you know he had all his collected objects from his various expeditions and you can see like a i think a leopard or tiger skin you can see like portraits of him and his wife you know and all these sort of various um, you know, knickknacks and objects that he had collected from a lifetime of travel and i believe you with this image of him uh, writing at his desk um which is painted by one of his uh, friends uh, towards the end of his life. So this is this is the final image I will stop sharing now. Thank you, um, Shana. 
Yeah. Thanks. I call on Ms. P, ma'am, to give a vote of thanks. Yes, yes, yeah. Hi, Sharon. Amazing, isn't it? The way you've seen us through this um, hour and a half. So, um, really, taken us on this uh, journey with this man who uh, went through um, so much. I began to feel rather sorry uh, for him when somehow things never seemed to work out or uh, the way um, uh, he was being treated and, uh, and uh, really, but he was an adventurer. And uh, it's a shame that you said his wife burned so many of his um, yeah. lectures. Um, so, so what happened was immediately after his death, um, like within, within like the next week, she practically went through every single piece of his uh, diaries, papers, books, mm -hmm. and everything she could find that she felt was obje objectionable. And keep in mind that she was a devout Catholic, even though they are buried in a very strange grave. Uh, if you go to Richard Burton's grave in London, Mortlake Cemetery, it, it is in the shape of a tent like a marble tent. But she was very, very uh, concerned that none of his objectionable material should survive. And so she basically just systematically laid waste to an entire lifetime's collection of manuscripts and paperwork. And um, this is very well documented by uh, eyewitnesses who were with her. Uh, again, as with, as with everything in their lives, the, uh, uh, she claims that the people who said so were people that uh, uh, were asking for money from her. And so they basically put about this rumor that, oh, this, you know, the wife of his uh, manipulated things and never gave us money and all of that. So uh, everything is a question mark. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I suppose, what um, when you research, you have to sort of sift and uh, and try and prove that this is uh, authentic and this is just a creative rumor, but exciting, exciting uh, journey. Um, are there some questions? Uh, I think something has lit up. Yeah, let me take a look. Yes, you want to? Um, I just saw one pop up, and I don't yeah. think there earlier. Ah. Uh... Did Richard have any connection with the famous in the horse regiment which still exists in the No, or Richard was in the infantry. He was not a, a cavalry man. In fact, uh, I think his father was trying to get him shifted out to the cavalry at the time that he took um, his sabbatical leave because he felt that he was not achieving much in the army. But uh, he was not a horseman. He, in fact, uh, uh, very famously had a Katiawar mare uh, which, you know, is not really an Arab or, uh, you know, you were expected to buy your own horse and then keep your own horse. And all of that was phenomenally expensive. So I don't think he felt that that was the way to go. And so he wasn't part of the, the cavalry at all. Um, uh, he was very much like his father had been in the army. He was an army man, basically. Okay, thank you for answering that uh, query. Um... And um, really, I can see piles of books behind you, Sharon, sort of something, something like Richard Burton's room. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is the book by Fawn Brody. And uh, in fact, Fawn Brody mentions, I think, like most of the introduction is given over to his attempt to locate the uh, uh, his attempt to locate the Karachi brothel report uh, about how he went here and there and the Delhi archives and the India house and he couldn't find anything. But uh, there are several other, uh, you know, biographies that come out. Some of them are inaccurate now because a lot of them, of course, came out right after his death trying to capitalize on his um, life and celebrity. So now they are sort of out of date with fresh uh, scholarship on the subject. But uh, Bartle, uh, someone is asked, yeah, what was Bartle Fair's problem with him? Uh, well, as I said, there was this separate contingent of men up in Sin, right? And the Bombay government sort of resented the fact that they had formed their little group up there. 
and uh, you know richard was sort of the bright star of that group because he knew all these languages and he could go around and like sort of converse with the locals and even pass as one of the locals and this sort of aspect of mingling with the natives was sort of looked at with like great suspicion um in the victorian era by now it was by the time battle fair came into sort of this thing it was the shift was happening from georgian era morality where you had the great men of like you know for example the east india company uh, monty elphinstein or octoloni uh, sort of almost assimilating and as you near the years of the mutiny um, you find more and more there is there is a distance growing between you know the officers and even their native regimental uh, sort of soldiers and the officers and their attitude towards the native populations so uh, battle fray is a prime example of that sort of slight standoffishness which came into bureaucracy at that time um you know he looked upon the fact that you know richard by this time had gotten names like ruffian dick uh, he had gotten names as i said like the white nigger he had gotten names of, like of various like uh, aliases and sort of uh, 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 kind of uh, personalities multiple personalities you can say alter egos so all this is very suspicious to battle fry like this is like what is what is this man doing you know so he had a, a bit of he had a bit of a tussle uh, richard found him too straight laced too much of a bore and then of course battle fry being like in a position of seniority was in a position to kind of uh, suppress tacitly richard's career like he very tacitly sort of never recommended him for promotion never gave him political uh, agency and so this eventually led to his frustrations with the bombay army i think um, it looks like people uh, coming up with uh, questions now but as you rightly said uh, we've been at it for a yeah. while <laughs> also my voice is giving out <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure you have a drink uh, so the throat <laughs> and thank you once again i'm yeah. always here on the group if any of you all want further questions or you all want to know about books and things like that uh, please ask uh, and i'll be happy to tell you all but i think we should wrap this up now so everyone can go off and enjoy the saturday night all right have a generous of you sharon and thank you for sharing all this with us you know, have right a Uh, although Holi has finished, have a great festive season, and tomorrow I think is Nowruz for the rest of the Iranis and Parsis. So happy spring! Yes, yes. happy Nowruz <laughs> to everyone who's going to celebrate. Let's hope the year continues on a good note, you know, with uh, things coming back to normal. And uh, we'll see more of you at the Asiatic. I hope people will now start coming in person. And thank you, Sharon. Said, and thank you, everyone on the Mumbai Research Center, uh, being so ably led by Chenas Nalmaga. Thank you, everybody, and uh, good night. Bye, Sharon.